YouTube. In today's video we're going to take a look at the Primex Soundstorm WaveSound M16C. It is a wavetable sound card, ISA of course from the early to mid 1990s, and it is 100% Gravis Ultrasound compatible. This is actually a Gravis Ultrasound uh, third-party implementation. We can tell it is in fact very much an ultrasound as well by the Gravis GF1 chip over there. And uh, yeah, I've always wanted a Gravis ultrasound. I have made a video on the power of the Gravis ultrasound many years ago. That was just, you know, me fiddling in DOSBox and having some fun with that. And I've always loved the sound that the uh, Gravis ultrasound made. It is a very nice wavetable card for the games that support it, obviously. I'll get to that in a moment. On the back of the card we have a couple of uh, ports here. Let's see, we have the speaker out over here, we have a line out over here, a line in here, and a microphone in here, and of course a game port for a joystick. If we take a look at the board, there's a lot of things going on. We have some RAM on here, this card is currently equipped with 512k. You have a memory expansion here, Probably it's upgraded to one megabyte. There is uh, there are a couple of games that will actually require more than 512k to uh, work properly on the Gravis Ultrasound. Remedy's Death Rally from 1996 is a good example of that. It will also warn you when you uh, run the game for the first time that you need one megabyte of gust memory to run the Gravis Ultrasound properly. So um, yeah, I'm definitely going to uh, hunt for another 512k for this. And uh, then we'll take a look at that as well. For the time being, I have a dual card set up that works very well, though. I have used this card already. It's in, uh, it is definitely in working condition. But uh, it was pretty much new in box. It was only ever opened once to see if the card was in it and to test it if it worked at all. So it is very much a, uh, a new card. Very, very nice. So we have a couple of headers here as well. This card was definitely meant for older systems that only had one IDE channel and uh, it was fully compatible with all the various different standards for CD-ROM drives at the time. So the top one is a connector for Sony drives, the one underneath it is for Panasonic drives, and that is Mitsumi, and then uh, beneath that, the bottom one, is just for regular old IDE drives. There's also a good number of jumpers on here to set various ARIA Q and DMAs for the various features that the card has. And of course on the bottom we have the 16-bit ISA connector. That's basically all there is to the card. We'll put it in the system and have some fun with it in a little bit. For now let's take a look at what kind of packaging we had. So this is of course the original packaging, like I said this one was new in box. Let's see which side I opened already. I could have reboxed the card as well, but it just couldn't be bothered, I'll be very honest. There we go. Put the box aside. Need to carefully keep that around. There we go. No shadow going on here. Oh well. Oh, I opened it up backwards. Yeah, that's 90s yellowed foam right there. Here is the most important component of the card in terms of software. This is the driver CD for MS-DOS and also contains all the various software for the card. Of course, we have a very simple installation guide over here. Go to your CD-ROM drive, install the hardware driver, install everything software-wise, yada yada yada. This is not a plug-and-play compatible card, so you have to set up everything beforehand. So if you were to run this under Windows 95, you first need to install the DOS drivers from this, make sure that's working in DOS, and then boot into Windows 95, and then install this disk to get it working under 95. It was an afterthought, 95 support, that's for sure. Here we have the user's manual. This particular card itself is from 1995. I know that because it has an addendum right here. There's some errata. 
It's dated June 28th, 1995. And there's also various markings everywhere that it's, it's a 1995 card, so it's pretty safe to say. It's a very short manual, there's not really all that much in it. It has some layout documentation. This is the most important section here. All the various RAQs and DMAs you have to set in order to not get any conflicts. And here is a DRAM jumper. And some stuff on the CD-ROM drive and some empty pages. So yeah. Here is the proper user's guide in all the various languages. Let's see here. It even has a brief history of computer sound. In the beginning, computer sound was produced by the means of a bit that toggled voltage on and off at a set frequency. Although crude, it served its purpose, producing a simple beep. Oh yes, we do remember that. French, German, all that. Makes sense, of course, because obviously there's English here, French here, and uh, German there. So. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's all the tour and all that jazz. I guess we should put it in the system. And of course, there's only one system where a card like this makes some sense in. And that is, of course, an Intel 486 system. It requires at a bare minimum a, a 386DX processor, but we don't have any 386s on here. We only have a 486. And this is, of course, my upgraded Compaq Desk Pro XE466. All right, here we are at the inside of the machine. We still have our DX4100 overdrive here, our cache card here. I have changed the network card out. This is now a 3Com Etherlink 3 card. It's easier to set up. It is more reliable than the AMD PC net that was in here. And in the bottom slot at the moment, by the way, I removed the video card. Uh, a viewer pointed out to me that there were actually Visa compliant drivers for the built-in Compaq uh, QVision uh, graphics card. So uh, I installed that instead, and uh, it's working very well, so I didn't need the ISA video card anymore. And uh, because we only have three ISA slots, the bottom slot is now filled with the Sunblast to Vibra 16. That is now com currently uh, in use for all the games that the uh, Graphics Ultra doesn't support, especially AdLib uh, compliant games that use FM uh, for, from the AdLib. Definitely need a Sound Blaster for that. The uh, Adelaide performance on the Gus, I haven't actually gotten it to work properly on that card. And I've heard some samples and it's absolutely terrible on uh, other Graphics Ultrasound cards. So I prefer to just keep it this way and use both cards with a, a loop cable at the back. Let's see if we can insert the card in the middle slot here. It has been in there before, so shouldn't be an issue. That's one thing I'll never miss from ISA cards. Sometimes you really need to force them in there. Really in a way that I'm not particularly comfortable with, but you know, that's just the way it is, right? Card is in now. You can close the case back up again. There we go. There we go, very nice and tight. That's the way we like it around here. I'll fix the optical drive, it's just, you know, there are still no rails in there. If you ever come across some rails that will fit this, <laughs> hit me up, I really need them. Now I just usually open up the drive, pick it up, and pull it forward until it sits on his lip again. It's merely for aesthetic purposes, but uh, yeah. Let's connect it up and uh, go from there. 
Okay, KVM channel is switched. Let's turn on the power. There we go. Fix the obstacle drive arrangement. This is what this CRT does, it needs to uh, warm up a little bit. Should boot into DOS without any issues. Sound blast initializing, ultrasound is initialized. Some errors on the network because this is still an image that was set up for the old AMD driver, or AMD network card rather. So let's show you that message that I got in Death Rally. If you go into setup, here we can pick Gravis Ultrasound. Here it says, warning, you need one megabyte of gust memory. We don't have that, so we can't use that. But we can run it just fine with the assembler settings that I've set up, which I will demonstrate right now. Yeah, it does do this. I need to figure that one out. Once you actually load into a game, it's fine. So, you know, just some room for improvement. By the way, it runs remarkably smooth on a 486. I really didn't expect this game to run as well as it does. But yeah, we can't demonstrate this game properly, so we'll just not do that. This is one of the games that works very well now. On a driver's ultrasound, just running by itself in emulation mode, this game has no audio. None at all. Let's turn that down a little bit. There we go. It's super effective. And obviously it runs great on, or it looks great on the CRT. I keep pressing the wrong button. Go back to DOS, yes. Another game that re relies on Adlib very heavily is Wolfenstein 3D. I'll load it up right here. This is Adlib music. It's also a game that the Gravis Ultrasound by itself does not have any audio in. At least I'm assuming because... Uh, ooh, that's not a great sound, is it? Yikes. Well, that was horrible. And by the way, when I say the regular Ultrasound, I sort of mean this card because I've never really had a real Gravis one. Because they're way too expensive. This car was half the price and it does the same things. So, you know, sounds the same as a, as a Gus Classic. So, you know. So that's enough Sound Blaster stuff. I uh, actually want to stay in the games folder for now. And uh, let's go for some Doom here. I think this one is set up for the... Gravis, yep, it is for both audio and music. And by that I mean sounds and music. Oh, yeah. 
Just so you know, this is just going to be a little bit of a quick demo of some uh, some games that function very well with the Gravis ultrasound. If I can, I'll try to capture some audio directly from the system and then I'll uh, add it at the end of the video. Another game that I very much enjoy playing and runs okay enough on this DX4100 is Duke Nukem 3D. Uh, it's also set up for the ultrasound. Excellent. Let's go for it. This is not even the Atomic Edition I see. I guess I installed an older version. That sound a hell of a lot better than R64, I tell you. At least it does to my ears. And I should be able to tell because I have an AWE64 as well as this ultrasound, so... Yeah. I definitely prefer the wavetable sound on the ultrasound a hell of a lot more. Alright, so... I'm not going to let this drone off for too long. Let's just go with uh, one of my other favorite games from the 1990s on DOS that also supports the ultrasound, Wacky Wheels. Oh yeah, that's perfect for me. Yeah, we only need to steer. Grim good. We're going at 30 miles an hour. It's backfiring like crazy. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely growing tired, you can tell, right? Right. Again, if possible, I'll uh, add some audio to the end of this video, so you can get a clear sound for uh, or an idea what it sounds like. Always capturing through a camera and through speakers, there's two layers of fucking up there. So, yeah. I hope you enjoyed this video, I certainly did. I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.